Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IS Academy for the date 21st of November 2021. So these are the list of articles chosen for today's discussion. If you can see, we have chosen two articles from FAQ section and two articles will be about preliminary oriented articles. So without wasting much time, now let us move on to the first news article discussion. Today, let us start our first discussion with this FAQ article. See, this FAQ article is about the procedure for judicial transfers. See, the issue of judicial transfers and the various controversies surrounding the collegium system is one recurring topic in the news. And for your information, in the year 2017, in GS Paper 2, we had a question covering the area of judicial appointments. The question is displayed here. Have a look at it. As you can see, it is related to the NJAC Act of 2014, which is nothing but the National Judicial Appointments Commission Act 2014. And with the recent issues around the judicial transfers and appointments, you can actually expect a question on this area this time, especially related to the collegium system that is in practice. So, it is always good for us to be prepared in this area both in prelims and mains perspective and this is the reason why I chosen this article for discussion. Now, coming to the news article displayed here, see recently a yeah, Chief Justice from the Madras High Court was transferred to the Mehalaya High Court. In the same manner, in the year 2019, another Chief Justice of the Madras High Court was also transferred to Mehalaya. Now, the issue is that these transfers have created a controversy over the question whether these judicial transfers are made only for the purpose of administrative reasons or if they have another sort of personal reasons or an intention of punishment behind them. And this article is written in this background. Now, based on this article, let us know some important points related to the issues of the judicial transfers which will help you in your preparation. The syllabus covered by this article is highlighted below for your reference. Please go through it. First, let's see what the constitution has got to say on the transfer of judges. So, when you take the Indian constitution, it is article 222 that is 222 which deals with the judicial transfers and as you can see here the article clearly mentions that the president may transfer a judge from one high court to another high court after consultation with the chief justice of India. This shows that executive has got the power to transfer a judge but only after consulting the chief justice of India. And clause 2 of the article mentions that a compensatory allowance is also provided to the transferred judge in addition to his salary. So you can see the article 222 here. Both the clauses are mentioned here. Just go through it. See, whenever you learn about judicial appointments or transfers, you should always remember the three judges case which led to the evolution of collegium system. But actually, before the three judges cases itself, the interpretation of article 222, that is, the issue of judicial transfer came up in the Supreme Court in the Union of India versus Sankal Chand Himatlal Sheth case of 19. 77. And two important observations were made in that case. One is that the Supreme Court rejected the idea that High Court judges can be transferred only with their consent. So, if a High Court judge is transferred, he can be transferred only with their consent. But what the Supreme Court did is, in the 1977 case, the Supreme Court rejected this idea of transferring the High Court judge after his consent. Since it felt that the transfer of power can or should be exercised only in public interest. So the first observation is that the Supreme Court made clear that the transfer of a High Court judge must be based on the public interest and not based on the consent of the High Court judge. And the second is with regard to the consultation of the President with the CJI. As we saw earlier, according to Article 222, the President is under a obligation to consult the CJI. This means that all the relevant facts must be placed before the CJI and it also said that the CJI have the right and duty to manage and find further facts of the judge concerned or others. So after this case only the three judges cases came. We have discussed the three judges case quite a lot of times in our Hindu newspaper analysis like on August 16, 2021. So 
we are not going to go much deeper into that i'll just give you a crux of each case judgment in the first judges case which held in 1981 the court observed that the president's consultation with the chief justice does not mean concurrence with respect to appointments to put it in simple words just remember that it emphasizes the primacy of executive in the matter of appointments and transfer that is the decision of president is supreme and the term consultation with chief justice does not mean concurrence so in the first judges case the court observed that the president's consultation with chief justice of india does not mean concurrence with respect to appointments but this was overruled in the second judges case which held in 1993 and in this case the court verdict held that consultation with the cji really means concurrence now here the opinion of the cji refers to the views of plurality of judges and it was this judgment that gave birth to the system of collegium so in the second judges case the previous verdict of first judges case was overruled and the court verdict held that consultation with the cji really means concurrence that is there must be a agreement between both the president and chief justice of india here the opinion of chief justice of india does not refer to a single person it means the view of a plurality of judges so this led to the birth of the system of collegium and the third judges case of 1998 further enlarged the collegium to a five member body consisting of the cji and four senior most judges of the supreme court so these are the important judgments that you need to know about judicial appointments or transfers you need not memorize all these just remember these facts that will be very helpful for your mains examination now let's very briefly see the present practice of judicial transfers let us see how the system of judicial transfer actually works when a person is transferred from one high court to another high court firstly have in mind that the proposal for transferring a high court judge including a chief justice should be initiated by the chief justice of india and in this the opinion of chief justice of india in this regard is determinative and the consent of the judge concerned is not required so the opinion of cji in this regard is determinative and as we already saw all the transfers are supposed to be made in public interest which is to promote better administration of justice throughout the country the opinion of cji is determinative in this regard and it does not require the consent of the judge concerned here so for transferring a judge other than the chief justice the chief justice of india should take the view of the chief justice of the court concerned as well as the chief justice of the court to which the transfer is taking place adding to this the chief justice of india should also take into account the views of one or more supreme court judges who are in a position to offer their views in the process of deciding whether a proposed transfer should take place or not and when it comes to the case of transfer of a chief justice see here the views of one or more knowledgeable supreme court judges needed to be taken into account when it comes to transfer of a chief justice of a high court and note that the views by other judges should or will always be expressed in writing and their views will be considered by the chief justice of india and four senior most judges of the supreme court which is nothing but the full collegium of five members so the views of the other judges should be expressed in writing and their views will be considered by the chief justice of india and four senior most judges of the supreme court which means the full collegium of five members so once this procedure is done the recommendation will be sent to the union law minister he will then submit the relevant papers to the prime minister and the prime minister then advises the president on approving the transfer so this is a process which is in practice now i hope by now you have a holistic picture about the process of judicial transfers now we have almost come to the end of this 
new article discussion see regarding the issue of the judicial transfers there have always been proposals for every high court to have one third of the total composition occupied by judges from other states what is the reason see one good reason for people to advocate this is because it not only promotes national integration but it also helps in avoiding narrow minded tendencies which are bred by caste kinship and other local links and affiliations but these transfer orders become controversial when the bar or the section of the public get a feeling that there is some motive behind it the motive may be like the presence of a punitive element behind the decision to move a judge from one high court to another it may be anything see a reason for this confusion is that neither the supreme court nor the government would disclose the reason for such a transfer now say for example the judge is transferred because of some adverse opinion on his or her functioning then in such a case disclosing the reason would impinge the judge's performance and also the independence in the court to which he is transferred so this is why it is not disclosed however the absence of a reason has got its own problem since sometimes it may give rise to speculations like whether the transfer happened because of complaints against the judge or if it was a sort of punishment for the for certain judges that inconvenienced the executive so the absence of a proper reason can raise speculations like these so these are the important takeaway points from the article here in this discussion we saw about what the constitution has got to say on the transfer of judges we saw article 222 in this regard and we also saw about a case of 1977 which gave an interpretation to article 222 and we also saw briefly about the first second and third judges cases and we saw the present practice of judicial transfer finally we concluded by seeing why there is an issue with respect to judicial transfers when a proper reason is not cited so these are some of the takeaway points with this learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now let us take up this news article for our next discussion see this article is about a study which talks about carbon sequestration or the long term storage of carbon now based on this context first let us have a basic understanding on what is carbon sequestration and then we'll see some important findings mentioned in the study see as we know carbon is found in all living organism and it is also the major building block for life on earth see carbon exists in many forms predominantly as plant biomass soil organic matter and also as the gas carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and it is dissolved in sea water also so when you take the process of carbon sequestration it actually refers to the long term storage of carbon in the ocean soil vegetation that is especially forest and in other geologic formations a very important point to note here is that oceans store most of the earth's carbon and although oceans store most of the earth's carbon still it is the soil which contains approximately 75% of the carbon pool on land see this number is actually 3 times more than the amount stored in living plants and animals and remember carbon pool is a word to describe the reservoir of carbon that have the capacity to both take in and release carbon so soil plays a major role in maintaining a balanced global carbon cycle now you may get a question you may wonder how carbon gets sequestered in soil so now let us see the answer for that see through the process of photosynthesis what plant do is that they assimilate carbon and then they return some of carbon to the atmosphere through respiration and the carbon which is assimilated remains in the plant tissue that is through the process of photosynthesis plants assimilate carbon and then they return some of the carbon to the atmosphere through respiration and the remaining carbon which is assimilated remains in the plant 
tissues itself and this carbon remaining in the plant tissue is then consumed by animals or will be added to the soil as litter when the plants die and decompose so the primary way through which carbon is stored in the soil is as soil organic matter and this soil organic matter is a complex mixture of carbon compounds which consist of decomposing plants and animal tissues microbes like protozoa nematodes fungi and bacteria in addition to the carbon which is associated with the soil minerals so to put it in simple words carbon is stored in the soil as soil organic matter this soil organic matter is nothing but a complex mixture of carbon compounds which consist of decomposing plants and animal tissues microbes like protozoa nematodes fungi and bacteria in addition to the carbon which is associated with the soil minerals and these carbon can either remain stored in soil for millennia or it can also be quickly released back into the atmosphere however the amount and the length of time period of this carbon storage depends on various factors like the climatic condition natural vegetation soil texture and drainage so this is how carbon is sequestered in soils naturally so so far we saw about how carbon is sequestered in soil we saw that through the process of photosynthesis the plant actually assimilate carbon which is later returned to the atmosphere through respiration the remaining carbon which is assimilated remains in the plant tissue which is consumed by a animal and when this animal dies or when the plant itself dies and decomposes they primarily contribute to the carbon storage in the soil as soil organic matter now coming back to the news article see the study has found that the carbon storage is found to decline shortly and this is actually giving a boost to global warming this is a very important matter of concern because release of carbon into the atmosphere obviously add up to the greenhouse gases and the scientists have also found out that the amount of carbon which is released from the soil depends on the soil type also for example the low clay soils are found to lose three times as much carbon as clay rich soils so in a study scientists have taken more than 9000 soil samples from overall the world and they have detected that the carbon storage declines strongly as temperature averages increases which further is giving a boost to global warming as the temperature average is increasing the carbon storage capacity of the soils is actually declining which is giving rise to or which is giving a boost to global warming so this is what the article is all about and the scientists have also stated that the amount of carbon being released it actually depends on soil type so these are some of the important points that you have to make a note of this is a very important article because we had a question in 2021 prelims regarding blue carbon so this might be asked in your upcoming preliminary examination and you can use these points to write in your main answer as well so with this now let us move on to the next news article discussion now let us take up this article for our next discussion see this article speaks about the gathering of buddhist monks from thailand laos myanmar in mahabodhi temple in bodhgaya if you can see in this image they lit earthen lamps and offered prayers for a pandemic free world so in this discussion let us see some of the important facts about buddhism in prelims point of view those who are preparing they know buddhism and jainism is a very important topic and you may expect one or two questions every year in prelims examination with respect to buddhism and jainism and if you recall buddhism is one of the major religions of the world that originated from the indian subcontinent has now spread to large part of the south east Asia and the basic tenets of Buddhism are explained through four major noble truths and it is said that one can be free and at peace through following the noble eightfold path 
so the details about noble truth and eightfold path are given here in this image just have a look at it we are not going to get into the details of these truths and paths because we have extensively covered about these topic in our previous hindu newspaper analysis instead we'll learn about four distinct sects of buddhism we'll see how the different schools of buddhism originated and we will also see major distinction between these distinct schools of buddhism so what happened after the attainment of mahapari nirvana by buddha to compile his teachings four buddhist councils were held it is recorded that in the fourth council in king kanishkash rajin there was a split in buddhism and two sects were born these two sects were named as hinayana and mahayana buddhism and in the later periods hinayana school declined and two more new schools under buddhism were born so let us see them one by one first of all hinayana buddhism we'll see about distinct features of hinayana buddhism make a note of these points it will be very helpful for your prelims and mains examination what does this word hinayana buddhism mean see it means lesser vehicle the school includes the followers of the original preachers of the buddha and it is more of an orthodox school and remember they did not believe in idol or image worship of buddha they believed in individual salvation through self discipline and meditation and the ultimate goal of hinayana is to attain nirvana for those who are not aware nirvana means a transcendent state in which there is neither suffering nor sense of self and the subject is released from the effects of karma and the cycle of death and rebirth so to put it in simple words nirvana means releasing from the effect of karma and the cycle of death and rebirth so attaining nirvana is the ultimate goal of hinayana and it represents the final goal of buddhism as well and one of the important point to note here is that one of the subsect of hinayana is theravada the hinayana scholars used pali language to interact with the masses and if you remember emperor ashoka he patronized hinayana sect as mahayana school came into being much later so emperor ashoka he patronized hinayana sect and another important point to note is that hinayana school in its original form is almost non extinct in the present age now talking about mahayana buddhism see it means the greater vehicle in contrast to the hinayana buddhism school this school is more liberal and believes in the heavenliness of buddha so here the ultimate goal is spiritual upliftment apart from this the mahayana followers they believed in idol or image worship of buddha and very important point to be noted about mahayana is that they believed in bodhisattva for those who are not aware what this word bodhisattva means see bodhisattva or bodhisattvas or enlightened beings who postpone their own salvation in order to help all other beings to attain salvation so those beings who postpone their own salvation to, in order to help other being to attain salvation is known as bodhisattvas and this concept of bodhisattva is the result of mahayana buddhism hence this mahayana buddhism is also called as bodhisattva yana or the bodhisattva vehicle and as per scholars one of the subsects of mahayana developed in the later period was vajrayana see the mahayana scholars predominantly used sanskrit as a language and emperor kanishka of kushana dynasty is said to be the founder of mahayana sect of buddhism in 1st century ad now presently majority of the buddhist followers in the world belong to mahayana sect countries like nepal bangladesh japan vietnam indonesia malaysia singapore mongolia china bhutan and tibet so these countries are some of the countries which are still following this mahayana sect now moving on next we will see about theravada buddhism see this school actually this word actually means to the school of elder monks in theravada the ultimate goal is the 
cessation of the klesha and the attainment of state of nirvana it is achieved by practicing the noble eight fold path and as i already said nirvana is escaping the cycle of sufferings and rebirth see klesha is nothing but it is a state of mind which includes anxiety fear anger jealousy desire depression etc so cessation of this klesha is the ultimate goal of theravada and the theravada actually believes in the concept of vibhajavada that is teaching of analysis pali is the sacred language of theravada buddhism and this theravada is contemplated to be a successor of hinayana school around 35.8 percentage buddhist in the world belong to theravada school and countries following it includes sri lanka cambodia laos thailand malaysia etc lastly let us see about vajrayana buddhism or tantric buddhism see scholars contemplated that vajrayana school developed as a result of royal courts sponsoring both buddhism and saivism that is this school has a unique feature that it has an influence of hinduism or it was influenced by hinduism see the main deity of vajrayana buddhism is tara who is a lady and it involved combining brahmanical rituals with buddhist philosophies these brahmanical rituals are veda based and this vajrayana buddhism is based on mahayana buddhist philosophy this school believed in tantras mantras and yat yantras superiority as being a faster vehicle to liberation and according to this school the mantra is an easy path to achieve buddhahood without the difficulties as compared to striving for six perfections or paramitas under mahayana apart from this know that 5.7 percentage of the world's buddhist population followed it and countries following it includes tibet bhutan mongolia and etc so in this discussion we saw about four distinct sects or four distinct schools of buddhism we saw how buddhism splitted into two important sects named as hinayana and mahayana buddhism we saw some of the distinct features of hinayana and mahayana buddhism and we also saw that the theravada buddhism is one of the subsect of hinayana buddhism and we also saw that the vajrayana buddhism is based on the mahayana buddhist philosophy so we saw all the distinct features make a note of it it will be very helpful for you in your prelims and it will be a value addition for you in your main answer writing so with this let us move on to the next news article discussion now let us take up this article for our next discussion see this article speaks entirely about coal its negative impact and why india needs coal see in the recent global climate change conference that is in unfccc's glasgow conference indian environment minister committed to phase down of coal rather than phase out for those who are not aware phase down means to reduce the size or amount by phases that is to undergo reduction by phases is known as phase down and phase out means to discontinue the practice i hope you are now aware about the difference between these two phrases so phase down means reducing the size or amount of something by phases or to undergo reduction by phases whereas phase out means to discontinue the practice production or use of something by phases in this discussion we are going to talk about the indian perspective of the statement facing down of coal the relevant syllabus is highlighted here for your reference please go through it first of all let us see why dependence on coal should be reduced see we know that at every stage of its life from extraction to burning coal causes severe damage see coal is an abundant fuel source that is relatively inexpensive to produce and convert to useful energy so it is a abundant fuel source and it is inexpensive to produce and convert to useful energy so this is the first reason why we are dependent on coal on the other hand coal is the single biggest contributor to anthropogenic 
climate change. The burning of coal is responsible for 46% of carbon dioxide emission worldwide and it accounts for 72% of total greenhouse gas emission from the electricity sector. Apart from this, coal mining is usually associated with the degradation of natural resources and the destruction of habitat. See, in order to mine, we have to clear the trees, plants and topsoil from the mining area, right? So, this actually destroys forest and natural wildlife habitat. And it also promotes soil erosion and flooding and stirs up dust pollution that can lead to respiratory problems in nearby communities. So this is the second reason why we should reduce the coal dependency. Thirdly, coal burning contributes to air pollution. See, air pollution from coal plants is mainly due to emissions of particulate matter and gases including methane, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide as well as carbon monoxide. See, these gases are harmful gases. Despite polluting the air, they also cause harmful health concerns. Apart from this, it also leads to, apart from this, coal burning also leads to smog, acid rain, increase in toxicity in the environment and in turn, it ultimately leads to global warming. Here you can see an image. Here you can see from 1990 to 2021, how much level of CO2 emission has been happened and how much it has raised. So we have seen the impacts of using coal so far. Now let us see why it is difficult for India to phase out coal despite the negative impacts. See, one of the reason is that coal is the cheapest and abundant fossil fuel in India. It accounts for 55% of the country's energy need and the country's industrial heritage was built upon indigenous coal. Here you can see an image. This image shows India's coal reserves and most of country's coal production is limited to Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Jharkhand and Madhya Pradesh. See, these states alone contribute to a total production of over 550 million tons, which is about 75% of country's total coal production. So, as I already said, as coal is the cheapest and abundant fossil fuel in India and it accounts for 55% of the country's energy need, we need coal despite its negative impact. Apart from this, coal is used to meet over 70% of India's electricity needs. See, most of this coal comes from domestic mines. In financial year 2020 to 2021, India produced 716 million tons of coal compared with 431 million tons a decade ago. Since it is abundant in India, it is considered important for the nation's energy security and is a key source of revenue for the government. So this is the second reason and if you remember the Prime Minister promised to increase non-fossil fuel energy capacity to 500 gigawatts by 2030. He also promised to meet 50% energy needs from renewable sources and reduce carbon emission by 1 billion ton in a decade. But coal is a reliable energy source especially when compared with the seasonal and diurnal variability of renewables. Apart from this, the coal mining and coal fired thermal power generation sectors, that is the thermal power plants which generate electricity through firing the coal are two of the core industries and together they contribute approximately 10% to India's index of industrial production. So this affirms their importance to the economy. So, considering the significance of coal in varieties of sectors in India and its significance in other developing countries, India argued that it is not fair to ask developing countries to phase out coal. See, adopting stringent steps to reduce carbon emission can drag down the growth level and it may affect efforts to reduce poverty. And a very important point to note here is that, see, the per capita carbon emission of countries such as India and China are still lower than those of many developed countries. According to World Bank data of 2018, India produces 1.8 metric tons of carbon emission per capita against 15.2 metric tons produced by the US. Here itself you can see the difference, right? US produces 15.2 metric tons while 
India produces only 1.8 metric tons of carbon emission per capita. And it should also be noted that the focus on ending the use of coal deflects attention from other fossil fuels such as coal and natural gases that are heavily used by the developed countries. If you remember at COP15 which held in Copenhagen, the developed countries made a promise to offer $100 billion every year to developing countries to achieve net zero emission. But they have not made good on their promise. So these are the reasons why it is difficult for India to phase out coal despite its negative impacts. Another important point why it is difficult for India to phase out coal is that, see according to an estimate by the Center for Science and Environment, the promise to reduce emission by 1 billion ton means that India would need to reduce its carbon output by 22 percentage by 2030. India is now actually meeting about 12 percentage of its electricity needs from renewable sources and increasing it to 50 percentage by 2030 will be difficult. See, while some renewable energy sources like solar are cheap, they are unreliable because of the intermittency problem. See, intermittency problem is nothing but renewable energy cannot always consistently produce energy at all hours of the day, right? So, we have this problem with renewable energy sources. For example, if you take wind power, we can generate wind power only when it's windy. Likewise, we also saw that the solar power is only generated when it is sunny. Solar power can be generated even in indirect sunlight, but the efficiency will be low. Thus, they might require the use of storage batteries which add to the cost, right? So, it will be hard for many low-income countries to invest in renewable energy. See, many low-income countries with low savings may not even possess the capital required, right? In such a case, how will they invest in value addition? So, this is another point that you have to make a note of. So, to conclude, even though developing countries like India and China are heavily dependent on coal consumption for its economic growth, measures should be taken to adapt to the changing climate and global warming. In that line, India have promised Panchamitra, that is a set of five goals in COP26 to address climate change and hope we should achieve this promise. So with this we came to the end of this news article discussion. In this we saw about why dependency on coal should be reduced. We also saw why it is difficult for India to face out coal despite its negative impacts. With this we came to the end of the news article discussion. Now let us move on to the next part of the newspaper analysis which is the practice prelims questions. See now look at this first question. This question is actually a previous year question. This question was asked in recently held 2021 preliminary exam and this question is related to the concept of carbon sequestration which we discussed today. As you can see it is framed in the format of a simple question and among the four options we should find the suitable statement for the question what is blue carbon. So this is a very simple question and if you know what is blue carbon you can easily answer this question. See blue carbon is a term used to refer to the carbon that is stored in coastal and marine ecosystem as simple as that and generally the coastal ecosystems such as mangroves, tidal marshes and seagrass meadows they sequester and store more carbon per unit area than terrestrial forests and due to this feature they are recognized for their role in mitigating climate change as well. So blue carbon is a very important topic and from our discussion you can easily infer the correct answer and the correct answer here is option A that is the carbon captured by ocean and coastal ecosystem is called the blue carbon. So now moving on, now look at the second question. This question is regarding the different schools of Buddhism. Consider the following statements regarding different schools of Buddhism. Statement 1, Hinayana Buddhism school believes in idol or image worship of Buddha. Statement 2, Theravada Buddhism is also called as Tantric Buddhism as it involves the use of mantras and yantras to achieve liberation. Third statement, Hinayana Buddhism preaches individual salvation but Mahayana Buddhism preaches universal salvation. Choose the correct answer using the codes given below. Option A 1 and 2 only, option B 1, 2 and 3, option C 3 only and option D 2 and 3 only. See 
the first statement is incorrect because the school includes the followers of the original preachers of the buddha and it is more of an orthodox school we saw that in our discussion and they do not believe in idol or image worship of buddha so the first statement is incorrect if you can eliminate first statement you can say option a and b are wrong so if you confirm either statement 2 is correct or 3 is correct you can directly arrive at the answer now look at the second statement see second statement is also incorrect because vajrayana buddhism is also called as tantric buddhism and scholars contemplate that vajrayana school developed as a result of royal courts which sponsored both buddhism and saivism which means this school actually have the influence of hinduism and the school believes in tantras mantras and entras superiority as being a faster vehicle to liberation so statement 2 is incorrect that is theravada buddhism is not called as tantric buddhism and it does not involved in use of mantras and entras to achieve liberation so the statement 3 is correct which means option c 3 only is the correct answer look at the third statement hinayana buddhism actually believes in individual salvation through self discipline and meditation ultimate aim of hinayana is nirvana and we also saw in our discussion that mahayana buddhism actually believes in bodhisattva concept of salvation of all conscious beings that is mahayana buddhism preaches universal salvation so the third statement is alone correct so the correct answer for this question is option c 3 only The main questions are displayed here. Interested aspirants can go through it and write an answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, like, comment, and share, and do subscribe to Shankar IS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.